Hey, Shalom, 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 Mishpika. Welcome again to the Congregation of Yashra All. I'm your brother, Kasada Bar. And once again, I want to thank everybody for um, giving me the opportunity to come into your households, to wherever um, you might be at, and give me the opportunity to go again, all right, into the book of Revelation. Um, I started the class yesterday and I decided a little bit earlier, all right, that I wanted to actually um, conclude with that book um, this evening. And what actually um, inspired me to actually um, finish up yesterday's class is that um, I had a very um, interesting conversation with the Moray um, a little bit earlier regarding uh, what's going on in the book of Revelation. And when I say what's going on in the book of Re Revelation, I'm talking about the preterist view versus, versus now the, um, the futurist view. And um, what I'm actually trying to do is to help everybody to get a clear understanding of what is happening with the, um, the Olivet dis um, Disclosure here, where uh, we have the Mashiach speaking to his Talmudin in the book of Matthew, the 23rd chapter and Matthew, the 24th chapter, where he's talking about things that are extremely specific, things that must shortly come to pass, shortly come to pass. And trying to put everything in its proper chronological order is going to be um, extremely important. And once again, I want to thank my good sister Sharon, okay, um, for timing in with us uh, this afternoon, all right, or this evening. And again, I just want to make sure that everything that I'm saying um, is, is clear. Everybody's understanding exactly what I'm saying. And again, if there's any questions regarding anything that I'm saying, please leave a message. And, um, and one thing that I didn't want uh, to be misunderstood, all right, yesterday I was not going over um, what was happening between Gog and Magog. That's not what I was trying to do. I was just trying to share that we see um, Gog and Magog being mentioned in the book of Revelation, all right? And we also see um, Gog and Magog being mentioned in the book of Ezekiel. And just try to show that this is, this whole prophecy, all right, from beginning to end is all cyclical, especially, again, when we begin to look at these four metals. These four metals are going to be extremely important because it's going to show us now how the redemptive role of the Mashiach actually works. Again, how this messianic, okay, redemptive role of Mashiach actually works. So again, um, I just want to finish up here with the book of Revelation, um, the 10th chapter. And what I want to do is begin with... Um, La 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 la, uh, 10 and 5, all right? But just a quick recap, we had talked about um, a very important word that we need to make sure that we have a clear understanding on is the book, uh, or the word revelation, all right? And just to do a quick recap, the word um, revelation obviously means to reveal, to unmask, to uncover. And so there was something that was hidden, all right, from Israel, and it needed to be revealed regarding now what was, about, what was about to happen in 70 AD. That time is so critical and keeping everything in its proper context. And again, I don't want anybody to get mixed up. But like I do in all of the classes that I do, Mr. Picard, what I wanna um, say is uh, first and foremost, let's make sure that we give all the esteem to the Father Ab Yahuwah for his love, his mercy, his kindness, just everything that he has been doing for the nation of Israel. And we are forever, I believe that we're forever in the Father's um, debt for everything that he's been doing for the nation of Israel. And we just want to make sure that we give the Father um, that credence and give the Father that respect. Mishpacha, listen, give me two minutes, all right? Give me two minutes. I'm out here in the backyard, and I'm going to need some more um, off, all right? I'm going to need some more insect repellent. So give me, okay, two minutes at the most. Hold two minutes.
Okay, I'm back with you, Mr. Vicar. I apologize for that. I mean, I just really want to make sure that I'm, I do this class correctly and I don't want any interruptions. And right now, these mosquitoes are, are doing the job. But I'm, I'm good to go now, all right? I'm all sprayed up and all prayed up, so we're, we're good to go. So again, um, this word revelation, okay, is going to be extremely important. It's going to help us to get a better understanding on um, how we should be looking at the book of Revelation. Um, and also, too, um, I want us to be to pay very close attention to a word that we're going to be using today is the word cloud. OK, what this cloud actually represents. And we're going to go a little bit more in depth with that this evening. All right. So let's look at um, the book of Revelation, um, the 10th chapter. And let's look at verses um, five through six. All right. Five through six. Um, it says, um, and the angel, all right, and we made mention yesterday that this angel is actually referring to um, the Mashiach here, all right? This is the Mashiach. And the messenger whom I saw standing upon the sea and the land, he raised his right hand to Shamayim, and he swore by him who liveth forever, all right? And so what I'm trying to do is put this thing in, in, a, in some type of context, all right? Because the center of all of our um, being, the center of everything that we do must be centered around um, the Mashiach because the Mashiach, all right, is in the Father. So with recognizing um, right order, right order now, obviously there's going to come a point as it tells us in, I think it's in 2 Corinthians, um, the 15th chapter, after everything is said and done, everything now gets um, restored back to the Father, all right? Everything gets restored back to the Father. So every single thing that we see that the Mashiach is doing, He's doing it in the name of the Father, all right? In the name of the Father. And so when we see now um, this messenger, who, I'm, who I believe to be the Mashiach, and he swore by him, which would be the Father, who liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things in it, and to the earth and the things in it, the sea and the things in it, that the time should be no longer, which is, which is extremely important. So when this declaration is actually made, where it says that and that the time should be no longer, this is again referring to what is about to happen to the other half of Israel. And when I say the other half of Israel, I'm referring to Southern Kingdom. We know that Northern Kingdom, all right, was already given a bill of divorce, all right. Um, and they went into captivity amongst the Assyrians in 721 BC, and that happened in three parts, not all at one time, but in three parts. And we know now what was supposed to have happened is that Southern Kingdom was supposed to have learned from their sister's disobedience, because disobedience brings about exile. All right. Again, disobedience brings about exile exile and what we having here now being that israel okay we southern kingdom didn't understand the time of our visitation and the visitation now was the coming of the mashiach and we didn't recognize the time of okay again our visitation we see that southern kingdom was given a bill of divorce beginning now in 70 a.d and once that happened we see that southern kingdom was dispersed amongst all of the nations the way that southern northern kingdom was dispersed and so again that the time should be no longer now um we're gonna go to verse same book revelation the 10th chapter verse 2 it says and he had in his hand which is the, um the messenger which is um the mashiach and yes the mashiach would be a messenger and one of my prime examples that I like to always do is to show that the Mashiach is a messenger where we will have the DNA. The DNA never leaves the nucleus. And I'm looking at this DNA now sending out a message, which is the RNA. The RNA is always the messenger gene getting its information from the DNA. So yes, the Mashiach would be the grand messenger having other messengers working underneath him, meaning now in particular, where we have Hosea, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, um, Zechariah, all these guys here. All of these guys now would be now messengers, all right, working through the, 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 um, the RNA, 
and the RNA working through the DNA, which never leaves the nucleus, would be like, for example, he would never leave Shamayim. He would always have a, repre a representer or representation of himself sending out the divine word to his messengers for the nation of Israel. So again, we have this messenger now swearing by him that liveth forever. But watch this. To show that all of this is cyclical, all of it, all right, it is cyclical. And the reason why I find it important for us to understand that all of this is cyclical, because on the day of judgment, like I brought out yesterday, there would be absolutely no excuse, no excuse, because all that we would have to do is look back at our history. Look at our history. And our history has always been bent or with us trying to understand shuv, which means to return, teshuva, which means to repent. Only thing Israel has to do is follow the blueprints. They're already laid out for us. Look what happened to us, okay, during the Babylonian uh, captivity. Look at us, um, or our people now, when we went under the Medo-Persian Empire um, captivity. Look at our people now when we went under the Greeks and now under the Romans. Only thing we have to do is check the footprints. Check the history, okay? And then now return to the ancient paths. And the ancient paths now is all about being obedient and being in subjection to the Mashiach and to the Father, okay? I, I just want to make sure that there's no misunderstandings. Now we're going to go to the book of Daniel. All right, the book of Daniel. And actually, now this is just a quick recap. We're going to go to the book of Daniel, and let's do this here. And um, here, the book of Daniel, the 12th chapter. Daniel, the 12th chapter. And we're going to do the seventh verse. Look at now the relationship, okay, between Revelation now. Um, the 10th chapter, verse 6, and Daniel, the 12th chapter, verse 12th chapter, verse 7. And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand, hallelujah, and his left hand, hallelujah, into Shamayim, and swore by him that liveth forever, all right, as I'm doing, that it should be for a time, okay, 360 times, 360 times two, and a half a times, half of 360. So we're talking about 1,260 days, okay, 42 months. So the destruction of Jerusalem happened now within three and a half years, beginning with Vespasian. And remember the history. With Vespasian now, he conquered Jerusalem. But now the ultimate now destruction of the temple now happened under his son Titus. So my argument, what I'm going to be sharing here now is that 66 AD is going to be extremely important. 66, 67, 68, 69, 70. All right. So we're talking about again, 1,420 days. All right. On 1,260 days, 42 months is going to be the time or the duration that it took now to destroy um, the temple. And we also now, after that whole process, we do have some, um, some, some rebellion now that is still going on. Because we do have now, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, where we have now, there was a group of Israelites now that did flee, okay, and they sought now refuge in Masada, okay? And that is also very important that we understand now um, that whole history there um, also. But I just wanted to share once again, when you look at the book of um, Revelation, the 10th chapter, all right, verse 6, we have here this messenger swearing by him that liveth forever. Compare it now to Daniel, the 12th chapter, verse 7 now. We see that all of this is cyclical now when again, Everything now is centered around the Father, around the Father now, because it is He now that operates in righteousness. And as the Mashiach said, there is none that is righteous but my Father, which is in Shamayim. All right? Hallelujah. Now, 
Let's read on to verse seven. All right. Verse seven. And I heard the man, OK, clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river when he had held up his right hand and his right hand unto Shamayim and swore by him to live forever, that it should be, guess what now, for a time, okay, this is all repetitive, a time, times, and a half, obviously, of times. And when he should have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, verse again, and when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, we're talking about Israel. That word Kodesh, that word holy people, is talking about judgment being placed on Israel. Israel, all right? Being that Israel is the bride, the bride now, it is quite obvious with understanding scriptures properly from his Hebraic perspective. Because there's only one bride. And being that the groom, the Mashiach, is married to the bride, and she's being disobedient, it is only right, only right for the groom to pass judgment upon his bride. And so this also lets us know too, Mr. Bacar, really think about this. There is only one bride. Because this judgment is only against, only against the nation of Israel. And I just want to just pause there for a minute, all right? Because I don't have a grand audience, as we know, um, this afternoon, all right? I'm out here now on the deck in the backyard, okay? And I was inspired to complete this lesson. We have our sister Sharon on the line, okay? And I'm sure we have a whole other, uh, a lot of other people too, okay? Um, but are there any questions so far, okay, where when I say that the only bride is the nation of Israel, and that the Mashiach is going to punish, okay, his bride, because the whole planet Earth and all people of the Earth is not the bride, only the nation of Israel. And so this chastisement is only coming upon the bride, okay? And it's gonna um, come to a max, okay, basically around 70 AD. And again, it did expand a little bit past 70 AD, around 73 AD, when you have now this last rebellion, or some, somewhat of a last rebellion now, in 73 AD. All right? Hallelujah. Okay, then let's continue on. Um, we have verse 8. Let me see if I have any precepts to that there. Um, watch how this goes. All right, this is going to get interesting. Verse 8. And I heard... Excuse me. And I heard, but I understood not. Oh, excuse me, that's in the book of Daniel. Let's go back to the book of Revelation. Excuse me. I'm like, what in the world is that going on? Okay, um, Revelation, the ninth chapter. Let's go back to that. Excuse me, the tenth chapter. Revelation, the tenth chapter. Revelation, the tenth chapter. Let's go to verse seven. Verse seven. Watch this now. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, I'm going to stop right there. Everything that we're talking about so far in Revelation, the 10th chapter, verses 1 to verse 6. This is not the, um, the voice of any of or the, the, um, the seventh trumpet blower. We have an interlude or an intercession or intermission at this point here. What John the Revelator is hearing from Revelation, the 10th chapter, verses 1, down to verse um, 6, and some of 7. This is the voice of the seven thunders, all right? Again, this is the voice of the seven thunders. And John the Revelator now was about to write down the, um, the information, well, the story of the seven thunders. But he was told now, not to write down that information. And like I was sharing yesterday, it helps us to understand now, being that John the Revelator was not writing down the voice of the seven thunders, that lets us know, okay, that lets us know that there is still more to the story, okay? Again, there's still more to the story. I don't know if y'all can see it the way that, I, that I'm seeing it, 
there is a swarm of, 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 of mosquitoes out here, all right? But again, your brother's good to go. I got the Ruach Hakodesh on me, all right? And I also have, okay, my off here, all right? To try to repel some of these, um, these bugs here, all right? Um, but again, that's what I just wanted to make sure that um, that I established, okay? And Yaram Yahu, Shalom, Shalom, my brother, okay? My peace and blessings to you and your Mishpachar. All right, listen. <laughs> yeah, listen, you know what? I'm going to have to get something to actually keep off these mosquitoes because I like the outside, all right? It's beautiful back here. I'm back here on the deck, and, uh, and, and I would rather do my classes back here when I'm not at the congregation, all right? But again, we're going to still get the job done. Again, um, Revelation the 10th chapter verse 7, one more time. And in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, watch this now, the mystery of Elohim shall be finished, finished, as he had delivered to his servants the prophets, all right? So this is the question, all right? What is now the mystery of Yah? Huh? What is the mystery of Yahuwah? What is the mystery of the Father? Listen, pay very close attention to details, all right? This is the type of person that I am. I like to pay very close attention to details because I don't want to miss anything, nothing. The more I know about my, my language, my culture, um, the redemptive role of the Mashiach, the more I learn about the, um, the seven principles or the seven festivals of the Father, um, the more it makes me um attentive all right to the father's salvation plan all right i i gotta be there all right i i have to um i i want to make sure that there's nothing that is able to remove or move me from my square all right no woman no child not jobs not the jab or anything all right i want to make sure that i am standing on um sound strong foundation and to put both feet now okay both feet in my square and stand in a strong position all right where there's absolutely nothing nothing now that can move me from Torah nothing and let me just say this too because we're gonna get into the mystery of Yah watch this listen to this all right because I was talking to Amore a little bit earlier today the kingdom of heaven is already set. It's already set, all right? Only thing that we need to do is to endure to the end. Meaning this, when we begin to understand what's going on in the book of Revelation, all right, and how the Mashiach is revealed, he's revealed at this point. And understanding his redemptive role, listen to me closely. When the Mashiach heard that John the Revelator, okay, excuse me, John the Divine, the Baptist that I'm talking about, okay, when he was in prison and John the Divine, okay, John the Baptist had asked his disciples to ask the Mashiach, all right, are you the one to come or should we be expecting another? That is powerful, all right, powerful. Because John is in prison because he's speaking out against authority. It is not right for you, Herod, to take your brother's wife. Not right. Okay. And so now we know that the sentence for John the divine now was that he was about to be beheaded. And just like any man, all right, even me, myself. I would have needed to know, listen, are you the Mashiach or should I be expecting someone else to come? All right. And so listen to the divine message. Watch how this is centered around the kingdom. Tell John the Baptist. All right. Go tell him. All right. The blind sees. All right. The deaf hears. The lame is walking. All right. So this is literal and plus spiritual. Because prior to the Mashiach coming, Israel was deaf, blind, okay, 
and they were in this dead state of mind. So there was a spiritual awakening. OK, I'm not talking about the literal blind that can't see, which th those blessings did happen. But I'm talking about there was a spiritual awakening, a spiritual awakening when the Mashiach began to teach his ministry to the remnant because not everybody believed him. Now, watch this. To give John the revelator, John the Baptist, excuse me, an um, answer to his question. Listen, stand on your square. And in, in death, in death, because you're not losing anything in this physical world, in death, you're going to inherit the kingdom. So watch this now. So the death and resurrection of the Mashiach with standing on our square, standing on our square and understanding, not moving, there is a kingdom to inherit. And one more example, we have the Talmudim, the disciples of the Mashiach asking him, saying, listen, we have given up everything for the father, everything, mother, brother, father, sister, land, houses, cars, the whole nine yards. It was asked, what then should be the end for us? Because you're going to die. We're going to die. As the Mashiach died. And rest assured, if the Mashiach had to give up his life, guess what? You would have to give up your life too. Now watch this. You should sit upon 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Everything that you see is temporary. It's only for a season. And nobody knows that more than I do. All right? In just a brief history, I had almost $800,000 in property. Almost 800000 And your brother is all gone. All gone. Things that I have invested in for 26 years is all gone. All gone. And guess what happened? I'm still here. There's nowhere else for me to go. And so I look at the Job story and how he lost everything. And I'm sharing with everybody at the sound of my voice. Listen, let's be one another's keeper. One another's keeper. Meaning now is that let's always make sure that we double check with one another, see how everybody is doing. Okay, then, so that we can all make sure that everybody is going to stand on his and her square. So, Kasadaba, what does this have to do with the mystery of, um, of Elohim? Let's go to it. The book of Revelation, the 17th chapter, verses 1 through 9. Let's look at this mystery, all right? This great mystery. Pay very close attention. Because we're still looking at, okay, um, this revelation that John the Revelator is, um, is seeing here. Watch this now. This is Revelation, the 17th chapter, verses 1, the first, excuse me, Revelation, the 17th chapter, verses 1 through 7, or 1 through 9, excuse me. And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vows. And we didn't get to the seven vows yet, okay? I'm just going to jump ahead a little bit which had the seven vows and talk with me, which is John, um, the revelator saying unto me, come hither. I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore. Keeping everything in its proper context. This great whore is Israel. The great whore is Israel, right? And we have our sister Sharon, um, Medals versus reward. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You're absolutely correct. So watch, so watch again now. Um, I will show thee the judgment of the great whore. And how do we know that this whore is referring to Israel? Watch it again. I'm, I'm going to say it again. The only one that was married at Mount Sinai is the nation of Israel. The word whore, fornication, these terms are used against or towards a woman that was married. The other nations can't be whores. They can't be fornicators. And the reason why is because of what happened at Mount Sinai. The other people that were there, they were guests. But the covenant was made with you. It is the woman, it is the bride, the nation of Israel 
that is at fault at, in all of this. She's the culprit. She is the great whore. She is the fornicator. And as we use this now on, on this on earthly terms, it is the same way if my Isha acted um, insubordinate to me, she would be called and considered a whore. Okay, a fornicator. Meaning now is that I can only use this type of terminology to a woman that I'm married to. That I'm married to. I can't go out there and call another woman, okay, a whore and that she's committed fornication against me personally. She's going to look at me and we'll say, well, listen, Kasadaba, what are you talking about? I'm not married unto you. So by um, keeping everything in its proper context, this great whore is the nation of Israel. So let me read on. I will show thee the judgment, and it happened in 70 AD. I will show thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. The many waters here, okay? And we're going to explain exactly what this means now is that Jerusalem was the prime center location for everything, all right? There was a lot of import and export going in and out of Jerusalem. It is very important for us to understand reading history, how important that is for us to understand and putting the pieces of the puzzle together. Because like I mentioned yesterday, right now we have a table full of puzzle pieces, full of puzzle pieces. And so the question now becomes, how do we put the pieces of the puzzle back together again? So that we can read and understand the scriptures now from a Hebraic perspective. Key, from a Hebraic perspective. Let me move on. Okay now, so this horse saith upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit or in the Ruach into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast. Watch this now, because we need to know who was actually carrying or giving this woman her power. Who was this beast? Read on, watch this, it's so easy. So he carried me away, me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. So again, what gave the nation of Israel this pride? Okay, we have our sister here, you got daughter of Babylon. Right, and so again, just to tap on that just a little bit, okay, because I, I like the, um, the feedback. When we look at this colossal figure, we're talking about Babylon, we're talking about the Medo-Persian Empire, the Greeks and the Romans, all right? Watch this. As we see the Babylonians fall, guess what? We see now the Medo-Persians come into power. The Medo-Persians now are an extension of Babylon, making the Medo-Persian, they are an empire, but they will be now the daughter or the sister are coming next in charge of the first Babylon. So when we have now um, the Medo-Persians being destroyed, guess what? We have the, the, um, the extension of Babylon and the Medo-Persians now coming into power with the Greeks. So all of this Babylon, all of it, Babylon, the Medo-Persians is Babylon, the Greeks are the Babylon, Babylonians, and then we have the final Babylon, which is Rome these Romans here, all right? So that would be the final. So when we begin to talk about the daughters, yeah, it's all one colossal figure. And again, be, watch this now, like I've been sharing um, in, in my other classes. This colossal figure is still standing. Still standing. And again, what we must understand, what is now carrying or giving these, given um, these four beasts their power all right because they're thus the um the um the peons or they're just the um the agents 
They're just the agents. And what we have to look at, okay, who is actually carrying the Babylonians? Who is carrying the Medo-Persian Empire? Who is carrying the, um, the Greeks and the Romans? And just like I was sharing with the Maury a little bit earlier today, look at this example. Okay, I'm from Newark, all right? So you will have now the drug dealers, all right? They're making a lot of money out there on the streets, all right? Making a whole lot of money. And what's happening now is that the, the, the police department now, they're arresting a lot of the brothers and the sisters now that are selling drugs. But watch this now. I would be more interested now on who is actually supplying the drug dealers. I'm talking about who is responsible for those big shiploads of tons and tons and tons of heroin, cocaine, and other drugs into our neighborhoods. Those are the, the those are the big wigs here. And so it's the same thing with these four metals here. All right. We need to understand who is the big wig behind this. And my argument now is based upon understanding the book of Revelation. Now, the main culprit in all of this now is the same devil. Okay. Nakash, this whisperer, this enchanter. Okay. That um, deceived Adam and his Isha back in the garden. He's the main, he's the main one. And once he's out of the way, we can now have that peace and that shalom, okay? That justice, okay, on the planet Earth. But as long as he now has um, um, emphs or, or, or um, disciples, okay, working for him, we're going to always have problems, all right? So let's get back now to this mystery. What is this, what is this mystery of Elohim that was talked about even amongst the prophets, all right? So we have in verse 3, So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast. This woman, she is sitting upon a scarlet-colored beast, all right? Full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color. This represents um, the royal um, stature or nature that she had. And if you go to the book of Ezekiel, the 16th chapter, it talks about how Jerusalem, okay, Jerusalem now, she was the envy of the whole world. I have put a gold ring on your finger, the gold chain, you know, the fancy attire. I have set you up, okay, to be a royal priesthood, a royal nation. There was nobody in comparison now to the daughter of Israel. Nobody. She was decked out. We were living in the land, in the land that was in comparison now to no other land. This was the land that the father looked upon all year around. The place where we lived at was called the realm of substance. There was nothing going on um, like Jerusalem. It was the place to be. Come on now, listen. Let's step it up here a little bit. And again, I have no issues with looking at scriptures now from a futurist perspective because after 70 AD, the question then becomes what happened next? Because we are still scattered amongst... Obviously here, the four corners of the earth, all right? So again, I just want to make sure that we keep everything in its proper context. Hallelujah. Okay, and um, verse 5. And upon her forehead, this upon her forehead will be the woman that is riding upon now this beast. And she's decked out, okay? This is Israel. This is Israel. She's decked out, but she's been influenced again by the adversary. And watch how prophetic shadow pictures um, look, all right? We have a situation where in the Garden of Eden, all right, we have um, the adversary promising Eve, okay, all of the riches of the world. You would be like Elohim, knowing both good and evil, okay? And so this curse now existed, okay, from that point 
even to the point of 70 AD. I pray that everybody understands that. Meaning now is that we see that these same promises that was um, offered to Eve and Adam took part of it also. Okay, we're not leaving him out. But those same promises now that was um, shared with Eve was also shared with the Mashiach when the Mashiach now gets tempted by the adversary after being in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. Okay, if you will bow before me now, I will now um, give you all the kingdoms of the world. All right, I will give you glory, fame, and everything like that. But again, we only we know that this is only for a season. And so the things now that was offered to, um, to Eve, she was given those things, all right? But it came with a consequence. And what's happening here now was that we have the nation of Israel depending on the other nations. And we did become rich, very rich. But it came with a consequence. And the consequence came now when we, that put us in a bad position with the father or with the bride, excuse me, or with the groom, where now we're now in, um, in opposition with him. All right. I pray that, that that makes sense. All right. So, again, in a part of her forehead was the name written. Watch this now. Mystery Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots, the abomination of the earth. And I saw the woman, which was Israel, drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Mashiach. Because where did Mashiach um, die at? He didn't die in Georgia. He didn't die in New Jersey. He didn't die in Florida. He died in um, in Jerusalem. OK, in Israel is where he died. And remember, when the Mashiach was speaking to the religious leaders in Jerusalem, he held a charge against Caiaphas and those guys there. I'm going to hold you responsible OK, for the death of all of the martyrs now, beginning with righteous Abel all the way to Zechariah. Zechariah, I'm going to hold you responsible. So let's make sure that we put the pieces of the puzzle together correctly. Watch it again. And upon her forehead was the was a name written. Was a name written Mystery Babylon. We need to understand who is this Mystery Babylon. Um, because it's being revealed, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abomination of the earth. And I saw this woman, which is Israel. She was drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of the Mashiach. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And the angel said unto me, okay, wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her. All right. My argument is, according to scripture, who is supposed to be carrying the bride? It would be the bridegroom. This is the reason why I keep saying that the woman on this physical terrain and even on the spiritual terrain, she cannot remove her covering on her own and the nation of Israel cannot operate under no other covering. You can't any other covering outside of Torah. We're going to have to now define that new covering and that new covering would be this woman that is drunken and she's being, and she's drunk because she's now being carried or being covered covered by the beast this is what we're reading here let's read it again um wherefore did is our marvel i would tell thee the mystery of the woman which is israel and of the beast that carrieth her that is covering her which have uh which have the seven heads and the ten horns the beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition and they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they believe uh, excuse me when they beheld or behold the beast that was and as and is not and yet is all right so i don't want to go too far into that okay because that would be um a, a, a future lesson but i just wanted to share with everybody okay is that the mystery was this woman um this mystery of this great harlot, okay, was actually, all right, the nation 
of Israel, southern kingdom to be more exact, because judgment is going to be placed upon or pronounced against um, the woman here, Israel. Okay, hallelujah. Um, now, I had talked about this word cloud. Okay, let me just pull up um, my notes here, all right, because I don't want to miss a beat. Oftentimes, when I'm going over my classes, um, I'm going to tell you what happens, right? Um, I, I be going through all the descriptions of my head, all right? I say, I'm going to say this, I'm going to say that, I'm going to say this, I'm going to say that. And what's interesting about the whole thing, when it comes time for me to do the lesson, I'm going to say about 90% of the things now that is going on in my head on how to present the lesson, it don't come out that way, all right? Because I try myself to do this preparation, and when I actually do the class, you know what, um, I stem from it, but it's like all totally new information, all right? So I just find that um, interesting um, oftentimes when I'm going over um, some of these scripts here. And again, I want to thank everybody for, uh, for tuning in with us uh, this evening. Uh, hold on one second, Mishpaka. One second. I just want to make sure everything is nice and exact, all right? No imperfections. Um, uh, <laughs> okay, just wanted to double check. Um, the word cloud in Hebrew, because I talked about before um, how important this cloud is. I made mention yesterday of um, the word revelation and how important for us to understand that word revelation. And let me just go back over my notes right quick, all right? I made mention that the word um, revelation or the and how it's associated with the word reveal. And it's the Strong's number, the Greek, it's the Strong's number 602. And it means to, um, to, um, to unmask or to make clear. And it's the Hebrew word anon, um, the ayin, the noon, and then the noon sofit. I just found it very interesting. Watch this. Um, actually, just, let, let, let me just read it, all right? Um, because it, it probably will make a whole lot better sense when I read it, all right? Um, what does it mean when Scripture says that the Mashiach is going to come with or in the clouds? All right? Very important. What does it mean when it says the Mashiach is going to come in or with the clouds. Let's read some of my notes here, all right? So I don't want to miss anything. I have now countless individuals both within, okay, and without the church, okay? Because when I be when I when I'm listening to these debates with these preterists, all right, they for me, they they they're teaching a um a replacement theology because it seems to me what they're doing is that they're in some type of subliminal way, they're leaving out Israel and they want us to adopt the belief of the church coming in. And my argument is the church of the ecclesia that is talked about in 1 Corinthians, I believe it's the 10th chapter, where it talks about the church that was in the wilderness. My argument is that that church that was in the wilderness is actually Israel, all right? So when I begin to say um, church, ecclesia, I'm talking about the nation of Israel. All right, when I say the word um, um, I'm, um, the ayin and the mem, which means nation of people, to be exact, I'm talking about the nation of Israel, the people of Israel. That's the perspective when, I, when I'm coming from, all right? So when you, if you see here, when I talk about church here, it's referring to, excuse me, the, um, the nation of Israel. But again, the Christian church, there, I believe they're teaching it this um, replacement theology, and that's not what the, um, the scriptures is talking about. I'm not talking about um, replacement theology here. Let me read on. Okay, so there's um, a lot of individuals, both within and without um, the church, okay, uh, the congregation of Israel. We cite Revelation 1 through the first chapter, verse 7, okay, as positive proof that when the Mashiach returns, watch this now, every single person on the planet Earth will witness this event, okay? And I'm saying that's not true, okay? In context with which, with what's going on in 70 AD. So again, um, 
When the Mashiach returned, every single person on the face of the earth will witness this event. In a lot of people's minds, my position is that that's not true. John, the revelator, okay, he affirmed in Revelation 1 and 1 that these things shortly must come to pass and that the time was at hand. John said that. So this revealing or this revelation now was to take place now amongst Israel. Israel, that's the world, that's the people, that's the nation, that's the church, that's the congregation, that's the ecclesia, Israel, Jerusalem. Um, these, that these things should surely come to pass and that the time was at hand. Okay, and that's Revelation 1 and 3. Let me just, I just want to just make sure that I'm, I'm backing everything up with scripture. All right, I just don't want to be saying things. Revelation 1 and 3. Um, 1 and 3. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy now, which is going to be against Jerusalem. This pro prophecy that's going to be against Jerusalem, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand, presently at hand, meaning now at this, with this present generation. At, uh, put, well, watch this, at that present generation. These things are at hand, and it's about to go down, all right? I'm sick and tired, okay, of, of, of all of these revelations, all right? The Mashiach coming in the nation of Israel is not understanding the time of her visitation. Listen, you know what? I had enough. Things are about to go down in 70 AD, all right? So let me just read on. Um, this time, statements are repeated at the end of the book, um, as well as in the book of Revelation, the 22nd chapter, okay? Let me go to the book of 22nd chapter. I just want to make sure that everybody understands exactly where I'm coming from. This is Revelation, the 22nd chapter, verse, um, I think it's verse 6. Um, verse 6, yeah, it's verse 6. And he said unto me, these sayings are faithful, okay? They're faithful and they're true. So we have the uh, Amuna and we have the Amet. These are faithful and true. And Yahuwah Elohim of the set apart prophets sent his angels to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. And I want everybody to understand things that must shortly be done. All right. Shortly be done. And we talked about in the book of Revelation, we'll go back over it again before um, the service is over, how this commission was actually given to John the Revelator. All right. So let's, let me read on. We're almost done. Also, excuse me, in verse 10, verse 10, what do we have in verse 10? Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It says the same thing in verse 10. All right. Let me just speed it up a little bit. Um, John the Revelator, the Revelator affirmed the book of Revelation was signified or signal uh, or symbolized okay um that every eye shall see him and i believe it has a deeper meaning because right now you can see me all right you're able to see listen i have a kufi on okay i have my mezuzah on okay i have my mezuzah on i have my um my shirt on and it has um a, a, a picture of the Mashiach on a white horse and there's a sword coming out of it, um, out of his mouth. So you're able to give now a description of me. But we have here the Mashiach coming in a cloud. So he's coming in a cloud representing now a type or a shadow. OK, you're not able to see him as you see me. But he's coming in a form that is not necessarily recognizable because he's being shrouded by the cloud. That's going to be important. All right. Um, it says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. And they that pierced him, and all the kindreds of the earth shall swell um, because of him. I want everybody now to pay very close attention to this. All right. I got emphasis on this. Notice the statement. Behold, he cometh with clouds. The very fact that the Mashiach was coming with the clouds is evident that we would not be able to see him now with the naked eye. With the naked eye. We see that John the Revelator, which is extremely important, that the revealing 
of the Mashiach was done through his vision. Okay, it was done that way. So what I'm trying to um, help everybody to understand, face to face versus now shrouded in the cloud. All right, you get more of the effect. You get more of the emphasis now when you're not um, shrouded with a cloud. Watch how these scriptures come into play here now, all right? Um, the Mashiach was coming with the clouds as evidence that we were not able to see him by the naked eye. Clouds seem to describe, listen to my presentation now, okay? Clouds seem to describe the fact that the presence of the Mashiach was shrouded in this cloud, all right? No one would see him except by the signs that were about to come to pass, all right? So we have signs, and they would be demonstrated in the clouds, all right? Uh, Yadon Yasrael, okay, Shalom, Mr. Bakash, Shalom, Shalom. Yadon, uh, uh, Yadon, excuse me, my brother, listen, you know what? Um, the be the Father's will, I'll be there tomorrow, okay, to pick up... Um, um, that, that, that shirt that I have, okay, I just, I've been extremely busy, but I'm glad that you're able to, uh, to, to, to tune in, brother. And you've been doing great work, all right, for the congregation of Yasharal and everybody that's been supporting you. Um, those of you that at the sound of my voice, listen, you got to go out there to um, a Memorial Drive International, um, it's called International, um, it's, it's a mall, it's called International Mall, I believe it's, it's, it's called, and go there and you can pick up some nice things from our brother Yadon, all right, um, a very good brother. Um, he does excellent work. All right. So again, and actually he was the one that did this shirt that I have on um, um, today. All right. So again, but back to the lesson. Okay. I just wanted to show now that anything that is masked in a, um, um, in, in a cloud or shrouded by a covering, you're not able to actually see the full essence of them. All right. Hallelujah. So, um, Okay, we have you done. Okay, so Tuesday would probably be a good time to come through. Um, I listen. I'll hit you up. All right, Aki, I'll definitely hit you up, um, and and we'll try to make some necessary arrangements when to come pick up this shirt. All right, but again, back to the lesson here now. But clouds seem to describe that the presence of the Mashiach was shrouded. No one would see him except by the signs. Okay, that were about to come to pass. This. For me, when I'm doing this research here, okay, because I try to be extensive in everything that I do, this fits the prophetic language of Isaiah as he pointed to the end of the old covenant, which is going to be extremely important. Are we in the old covenant now or are we in the new covenant? All right. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more, um, but not right now. Okay. But I just want to share some things here. This fits the prophetic language of Isaiah, okay, as he points, uh, as he pointed to the end of the old covenant covenant Israel old covenant Israel when he said sovereign when thy when thy hand is lifted up they would not see but they shall see it let's go to the book of Isaiah the 26th chapter all right I want to prove everything that I'm saying through scripture all right and I know I opened up a window um, but I, I don't want to talk about it right now all right because I don't want this lesson to go any further than it it, it has to I want to stay with inside of the confines, okay, of Revelation, the 10th chapter, and I'm just going to bring in scriptures here now, okay, to help support my argument, okay, behold, he cometh in, um, in clouds or with clouds. I just want to show these things in scripture, all right? So we have now the book of Isaiah, the 26th chapter, verse 11. Watch how this read. Sovereign, when thy hand is lifted up. We went to the book of Revelations, the 10th chapter and the 6th verse. And we talked about how the two hands were lifted up, okay, and it made this vow or it swore to the mighty one in heaven that liveth forever. Then we went to the book of Daniel, the 7th chapter, and it talked about this mighty one standing upon the waters with both hands up into Shamayim, making this um, declaration um, or this proclamation here that, listen, you know what? All um, esteem belongs to the Father that dwelleth in heaven. All of this is outlined in scripture, all right? Hallelujah. So um, watch this now. Sovereign, when thy hand is lifted up, they will not see, okay? Watch this now. But they shall see and be ashamed for their envy. So what does that mean? They shall not see, but they shall see. So again, this whole situation that happened with 
um, the Mashiach speaking to the religious leaders in Jerusalem, when he says that you shall see the, com um, the coming of the Son of Man, how did they see the Mashiach? Did they see him physically or did they see him now coming now, okay, in the clouds now, in the clouds now, because again, there was destruction that happened in Jerusalem. So they shall see and at the same time, they should not see. All right, and we're going to go into some more scriptures, all right, to show exactly what this whole thing means. Let's go to the book of Exodus now, the 19th chapter, verse 9. Exodus, the 9th chapter, verse 9. And I pray that I am not confusing anybody. Exodus, the 9th chapter, verse 9. All right, here we go. And it shall come to pass, uh, Exodus, excuse me, 19, 19, 19 and 9. All right, excuse me, Exodus 19 and 9. 19 and 9. Watch this. And the sovereign said unto Moses, watch this now, lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud. So the Mashiach has been coming or visiting Israel all the while. All the while. But because of sin and iniquity now, he, we can't recognize or understand the Mashiach in his fullness, in his full esteem. So we have the Mashiach now visiting Israel shrouded in a cloud. Let's read it again. And Yahuwah said unto Moses, Lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud, that the people may hear wherein I speak with thee, and believe thee forever. And Moses told the words of the people unto Yahuwah. And so now, this wedding ceremony now, that happened between um, the Mashiach, okay, and the bride, it happened now in a shroud. Okay, they were not able to see the fullness because, again, Israel is still in iniquity. And remember this also. I think it's in the book of Genesis, the fifth chapter. It makes mention now when Adam was expelled from the garden, everything from that point going forward now is now in the image of fallen Adam. Adam was in another realm or, or he was in the likeness of the divine ones in the Garden of Eden. But when he fell now, he lost his ether or he lost his spiritual aura about himself. And so now, in order to see the Mashiach now, okay, then we're seeing him now interact with the nation of Israel now, once, especially after his death and resurrection, all right, we see him now operating within, with Israel and through, um, through, through the, this shrouded cloud. Now watch this. Oh, we, we, we'll get into it, all right? So again, Exodus 19 and 9, what we just read now, um, Let's also go to the book of uh, Exodus, the 34th chapter. Exodus, the 34th chapter, and I pray that everybody is following along. Exodus, the 34th chapter, I'm going to read verses uh, 4, 34th chapter, verse 5. Watch this. And Yahuwah descended in the cloud. The cloud. Pay very close attention to that now, how this relationship is working now, okay? Because again, Israel is wicked. We collectively as a people, we're wicked. So again, this is how I have to interact with them. And the and Yahuwah descended in a cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of Yahuwah or um, Yah, the yod heh hu -Hey, all right? And uh, what else do I have here in my record? So uh, we have now, and Yahuwah descended in the cloud. So Yahuwah's presence was always, again, shrouded by a cloud. Um, I want to make sure that we, we hit home with this. We want to go to the book of, um, I have here Isaiah 19, Isaiah 19 and one. Watch how this goes, Mishpaka. Isaiah 19 and one, 19 and one, 19 and one, 19 and one. Here we go. The burden of Egypt, behold, the sovereign rideth upon a swift cloud so how were the judgments how did the father okay judge um egypt he judged egypt through okay his manifestation through with this side of this shrouded cloud the cloud all right 
how was Israel traveling, okay, in the wilderness for 40, for 40 years, all right, um, through a cloud, okay, this flaming fire, okay, by night, okay, and this cloud by day. And you go to the book of Genesis, the 15th chapter. How was this covenant made with Abraham? We see this smoking furnace. A smoking furnace presents what? A cloud. And it goes between the pieces. All right. It goes between the pieces. Let me read on. Um, what do we have here with my notes? Okay. Um, so again, Yahuwah's presence was shrouded from the Egyptians as Elohim punished their nation um, with the armies of, um, as we know, as Sargon of Assyria in Isaiah, actually the 20th chapter, verses 1 through 5. Watch this. And this is my brother's, um, my brother, Yasablanu's favorite script here. I think this is one of his favorite scripts here. All right, anyway. In the year that, uh, Tartan. This is Isaiah, the 20th chapter, verses 1 through 3. I'm going to read. In the year that Tartan came into Ashdod um, and fought against Ashdod and took it. Watch what happens here now in verse 2. At that same time spoke Yahuwah by Isaiah, the son of Amos, saying, watch this. Go and loose the sackcloth from off thy loins. All right. And put off thy shoe from thy foot, and he did so, and walking naked and barefoot. Okay, so let me read verse 3. And Yahuwah said, said, like as my servant Isaiah have walked naked and barefoot three years, for a sign, for a sign, for a sign, okay, and wonder upon Egypt and upon Ethiopia. Okay, so listen, whenever something is clothed, all right, you can't actually see it, all right? So we now have a revealing. There was a revealing here that is happening where now it's a sign where Isaiah is going to show now what is going to now be the end or what's going to now happen now um, between Egypt and Ethiopia. And it's going to also make mention now, um, this thing is going to get so um, embarrassing now where even the buttocks is going to be shown, all right? And so now I just found that interesting here, but I'm not going to get into that now, is where you even see the dress codes of um, our brothers and sisters. And I can't see for the life of me where um, our sisters believe that it's um, okay to show off their, their, their buttocks, all right? When that at one point was considered um, a shameful thing to do, but now it's become a custom and everything is told me, yo, where everybody believes, or well, some people believe that it's okay to actually... Um, Give me some more <laughs> off here, all right? Uh, where it's actually okay to actually show off your, um, your your privates, all right? And so again, I also find this interesting here, even in the book of Genesis, all right? Where we have now a situation where Adam and Eve, all right? They had a different covering, all right? So whenever something is covered, you can't see what it actually is. And we see that Adam and Eve, they covered themselves. And so now when the Mashiach now, let's, okay, I keep it simple. When the, um, the messengers had called for Adam, Adam, you know, he, you know, where are you? And he said, I, I hid myself. And so we know that he hid himself among the trees. But watch this now, the word naked now in Hebrew is Arom. So to be naked, so um, I'm not going to get into the argument whether or not Adam and this Esha were walking butt naked in the garden. All right. I, I, I have a different view on that, uh, whether they were walking butt naked. But uh, my argument would be is that um, they, the word Aron means naked. It just means that when they were in the garden, um, they were transparent. Okay. I can see you for who you really are. OK, not necessarily they were walking around with everything swinging all over the place. And watch this now. If they were fine, I, I would never argue with anybody with that. I'm only sharing now the word Aron, which means naked. And they knew that they were naked. And so now when the Mashiach or, or when, the, when Elohim calls for him, he said now that they were under a, a different covering. 
But the way that the Mashiach wants to interact with us, he don't want us shrouded. He don't want a covering about us, all right? He wants to see us for who we really are, the same way that we want to see the Mashiach for, uh, from where, for, for who he really is. So because inside of a wedding, you should be able to see exactly who your partner is, all right? So this is the reason why in a marriage now, what happens now is that the bridegroom, she walks down the aisle, okay, and she has a veil on. And so once they come together now, the, the groom removes the veil. He's actually able to see his bride. And so it's the same thing with the groom. We want to see exactly who it is that we're coming in contact with, all right? So I pray that that was understandable, all right? And I didn't um, lose anybody there, all right? So let's move on. Let's finish this up. Um, so we went to the book of Isaiah, the 20th chapter, all right? And we read um, verses 1 through 5. Mm, yeah, for the most part, we did, all right? <laughs> okay. Um, let's go to the book of Matthew, um, the 17th chapter, all right? Because I'm just trying to um, speed things up here a little bit. Because if anybody know me, if you truly, truly know me, listen, you know what? This is what I like to do, all right? In order to have a relationship with me, well, listen, I'm going to tell you. Um, you're going to have to put into um, in, in, into your um, your relationship with me, you're going to have to understand that, listen, uh, that the sister would have to understand, Maisha would have to understand that this, this is a big part of me, all right? A very, very big part of me. I like reading scripture, all right? I can do this um, all day, every day, okay? And again, you know, we all have to put side, put time aside for our significant loved ones, and I do that. I do that, okay? I, I, I do that. I don't want nobody to get anything twisted, okay? But again, Matthew the 20, what, what did I say? I said Matthew, we're at but my notes, my notes, my notes, my notes here. I don't want to miss anything because a lot of times I have things running um, and I, um, I, I miss my notes, so um, we're in the book of Matthew, the 24th chapter. Okay, let's do Matthew, the 24th chapter. The 24th chapter verse, let me see where I want to start at. The 24th chapter, I think it would be a good idea to start at verse 30. 30, 30, 30, 30. Let's read that. Um, 30 and then shall appear the sign the sign as we just got finished reading the book of Isaiah okay the sign and then you shall appear the there, there shall appear the sign of the son of man in Shamayim and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the son of man coming in the clouds okay not physically in like the way that you and I see each other now He's going to be coming in the clouds, all right? In the clouds, us um, heaven with power and and it says glory or with esteem. And then I want to jump down to verse 34, where it says, Verily I say unto you, this generation, again, this is important, I say unto you, this generation shall not pass. This generation shall not pass to all things be fulfilled, okay? And we do see that things come into um to an end in basically 73 AD, and there were other insurrections even after that. But I'm talking about the complete destruction of um, Jerusalem. We do see that happening now in 70 AD, and one of the the last, I guess, a major uprisings, okay, or or or, um, or um, revolts or resistance we see happening at Masada, okay, at Masada. Now. Um, I think pretty much, Mr. Kyle, we, we might have the gist of this, okay? I have a whole lot of more scriptures here, but let me just read the last scripture here, the book of Acts 1 and 11, all right? 1 and 11. It's just, I just have so many scriptures here, and I guess if I ever had to do um, a debate, okay? I pretty much, I don't, I don't like doing debates. If I had to have a discussion on, on Sal's debate show or, or any other ones, um, I, will, I, I will bring out the whole um, artillery then at that point. But I think for the most part, everybody here gets the point, all right? So we're gonna go to the book of Acts, okay? The 11th chapter, the first chapter, verse 11. Or let's start at verse nine, verse nine. 
Acts 1 and 9. And when he has spoken, let me verse verse 8, okay? Oh, wait, verse 8. Verse 8. Acts, the first chapter, verse 8. But you shall receive, talking about the um, the Talmudian of the um, of the Mashiach, but you shall receive power after that the Ruach HaKodesh has come upon you. And you should be a witness unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And when he has spoken these things, while they beheld, he was the Mashiach was taken up in a cloud, and this cloud received him out of this sight. And while they looked steadfast toward Shamayim, and as he went up, behold, two men stood by him in white apparel, when which he which also said, You men of Galilee, why stand you gaz gazing up into Shamayim? The same Mashiach was taken up from you into heaven shall come so so come in like manner as you have seen him go up. So the Mashiach went up in a cloud, and he's going to come back in a cloud. In the cloud only represents now is that he's going to show his signs and his wonders now in the cloud. As Moses goes up to the top of the mount, whenever you're in the divine presence of, um, of the Father, or the Mashiach now, you have... Mm, 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 mm. You have now um, the revelation where Moses, Moses now uh, had this glow about him. Okay, he had this glow about him, and they had to put a shroud, okay, or, or, or cover him, because at that point, Israel was not able to uh, understand the fullness of, of the Mashiach and one more I just want to just share with the Mishpachah I'm sure everybody's already familiar with the script um, let's see here hold on one second Mishpachah I think it's in the book of Matthew uh, let me see something right quick hold on one second and we're almost done this will be the last scripture this will be the last one and I appreciate everybody's time and patience um, uh, let's see here yeah there it is okay I just needed to find something right quick let's go to the book of Matthew the 17th chapter and we'll end it there um, I'm going to start at verse 1 so this is Matthew the 17th chapter verse 1 now at the six days the Mashiach taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart, and was transformed or transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as light. Okay, and we see that whole description now in the book of uh, Revelation. And behold, there appeared unto um, them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto the Mashiach, Sovereign, it is good for us to be here. Uh, to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Watch what happens. While he yet spoke, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud. Okay, which said... This is my well. Um, this is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear you him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face, and they were so afraid. And the Mashiach, watch this now. And the Mashiach came, and he touched them, and, and said, "Arise, and be not afraid." And when they had lifted up their um, lifted up their eyes, they saw no man except the Mashiach only. And as they came down from the mountain, watch this now. The Mashiach charged them, saying, "Tell this vision to no man, until." until 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 the son of man be risen again from the dead okay so now what's so interesting now about revelation the first chapter and ending is that we have let's back up here um in matthew the 17th chapter we have peter james and john these three individuals are extremely important to the, the mashiach's ministry by the time 66 AD rolled around, okay, we have Peter and we have James already dead. Already dead now, okay? Now, um, 
it talked about this vision here that is being seen is not to be shared until after the death and resurrection of the Mashiach. And we have this now prophecy come into fruition because John the Revelator is going to actually now, guess what, tell this story. He's going to tell this story or it's being revealed to him now in the book of Revelation. Now watch this now. After John the Revelator now, he actually um, is he receives this revelation. He's given the little book and everything like that. And after he um he, he eats this, is is good to the to the taste, but in his belly is is like um is bitter. And this little book is now representing now on um, the book of life. I talked about that yesterday. In conclusion, Ms. Picard, in the end of Reve uh, Revelation, the 10th chapter, it talks about how John the Revelator now obviously did not die on the island of Patmos. It says he then must go again, okay, and preach the ministry now. Let's just read it, okay? And, and I promise that this will be the last um, script that we, we, we read here. Um, Revelation to 10th chapter, verse 11, because everything else I've, I've pretty much concluded. Uh, it, it's, it's not brain surgery from, from this point going forward. Um, and he said unto me, thou must prophesy, okay, verse 10. And I took the little book out of the, uh, the angel's hand, who I'm saying this is Mashiach, and ate it up. And it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was better. You can also go to the book of Ezekiel, the second chapter, verse 8, where it also talks about this little book. And he said unto me, thou, um, John the Revel Revelator, thou must prophesy again. Okay, remember now, he was put on the island of Patmos for prophesying or talking about the Mashiach. And so the very thing that put him on the island of Patmos on this salt mine, guess what? He's going to now be released from the island of Patmos. And he's going to do the very same thing again. He's going to stand on his square and he's going to continue to minister and teach about the Mashiach. And he said unto um, and he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. So again, understanding how the Mashiach is speaking to the nation of Israel, even to this very very day, excuse me, is through a shrouded cloud, this covering. But there's going to come a point now at the end of everything, okay, when we have this reunification, both northern and southern kingdom, when the uh, the voice of these dead saints now which are underneath the golden altar now as things are being prepared now for the um the final um culmination now of, of all things um we're going to now see the, the the um the bride and the bridegroom now tabernacling together and we're going to see now again the conclusion of all things i pray mr Carr, that that was clear <laughs> okay and if it wasn't clear listen you know what i have all the patience in the world Okay, because I understand that um, this revelation, I believe, that was given to me, it took time, patience, and um, I pray that you also are able to um, see the same thing, all right? And again, if there's any questions, please let me know, and I'm just going to say, all right, my peace and blessings to the nation of Israel, um, and to all those that are listening to the 12 trials that are scattered abroad in the book of James 1 and 1, my peace and blessing goes out to you. We're living in some real um, difficult times here now. Let's um, stay in prayer. I'm um, fasting. And let's keep our eye on the prize. All right. And with that, I'm going to say Layatov. All right. Shalom. Shalom.